Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Nita Farahani. I am a professor of law and philosophy here at Duke University, where I'm also the director of the Duke Initiative for Science and Society. On behalf of the Duke Initiative for Soci Science and Society and the Center for Science and Technology Policy, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar. Just a little bit of background about the Duke Initiative for Science and Society and the center. So the Duke Initiative for Science and Society is an interdisciplinary initiative at Duke that fosters research, education, communication, and democratic deliberation, as well as policy engagement on the ethical progress of science and technology in society. Um, we're delighted to be able to host both the Masters in Bioethics and Science Policy, um, as well as several centers. Uh, our um, crowning achievement center being the one that you're here to really be able to uh, engage with today, which is our Center for Science and Technology Policy, which is directed by Matt Peralt. Um, the Center for Science and Technology Policy is um, a pivotal institution at Duke, uh, but we hope also within the world of science policy and technology policy, um, being able to take research from academic institutions, take concerns that are in society and to be able to translate those concerns um, into real world concrete policy options that have the potential to be able to address problems in our society. Um, if you haven't done so already, I encourage you to check out the podcast that's hosted by the center, which is Tech by Design the white papers that have been published by the center um, about most recently transparency and political advertisement, but also it's important work to date on section 230. You can find regular uh, both media contributions as well as discussions, webinars like this one and other important conversations to try to move toward concrete policy solutions by the center and its work. I want to acknowledge today our co-host, the Campaign for Legal Center, um, and also to acknowledge our co-sponsors for today, which include the Duke Center on Law and Technology and the Duke Program in the American Grant Strategy. This panel today, which we're so honored to be able to host today, brings together diverse panelists and diverse viewpoints. This is one of the missions of the Center for Science and Technology Policy, who are also speaking to different audiences. Being able to bring together these diverse stakeholders is the best way we believe to be able to help foster the dialogues that are necessary to get to important and impactful concrete policy solutions for some of the most vexing problems that we face today in technology policy. Um, it also enables us an opportunity to investigate and to interrogate solutions to the most pu pressing public problems. With no further ado, I will ha hand it over to Scott Brennan, who will be introducing the panel and helping to moderate the discussion today. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Nita. Um, so as Nita said, my name is Scott Babwa Brennan, and I'm the Senior Policy Associate at the Center on Science and Technology Policy here at Duke. Now, the, the idea for this panel uh, in the report that we released at the beginning of March came as an outgrowth, um, as like a, a side effect, if you will, from an ongoing research project to try and understand the impact of the recent platform political ad bans. And when I began to, to really dive into existing FEC data, I was shocked to see what I couldn't see, that the majority of political advertising spending happening around, around the election uh, ran through ad agencies and consultancies but we can't see how and where those consultancies spend, spend money on, on behalf of those, those campaigns. Now, sub-vendor political reporting requirements is without a doubt an incredibly arcane topic. But as we're going to discuss over the next hour, uh, it is one that has significant influence on our ability to see, study, and audit election spending. And of course, concern about election finances is, is by no means a new, a new topic, especially in the decade uh, since the Citizens United decision. But often that concern focuses on contributions to committees and political organizations. But what I hope this discussion can help do is to show that we can't only be concerned with where political money comes from. We have to also look at, at where it goes. Now, with that being said, I'm so incredibly excited to welcome four amazing panelists today. They are uh, Commissioner Shana Broussard, uh, currently serves as chair of the Federal Election Commission. She joined the commission in 2008 as an attorney in the Enforcement Division of the Office of General Counsel. Chair Broussard previously was an attorney advisor at the Internal Revenue Service, uh, Deputy Disciplinary Counsel at the Louisiana Attorney Disciplinary Board, and a New Orleans Assistant District Attorney. Brendan Fisher is the director of the Federal Reform Program at the Campaign Legal Center, a nonpartisan election law organization. His expertise is in federal campaign uh, finance law. 
Jordan Lieberman has led the political and public affairs sales team at A4 Media for more than four years, and before that published campaigns in Elections Magazine. And Tatenda Musa Pataki is the founder and CEO of the Voter Formation Project and a former Facebook manager and digital consultant. And uh, thank you all again so much for, for, for joining us today. Now I have, I have four big questions that I'm hoping will guide our conversation and help us in, interrogate this issue. Uh, really briefly, they are, what is the state of regulation concerning sub-vendor reporting? What sort of problems arise from current regulation? How might we address those problems? And then what are the sort of costs and benefits of changing the reporting requirements and closing this, this, this loophole? And I'll reserve some time at the end for Q&A with the audience. So please, if you have questions, um, uh, uh, enter them into the chat and also try and keep an eye on the chat during the conversation as well. Um, okay, great. So with that being said, uh, Brendan, I'd, I'd like to start with you actually. And uh, I was hoping you could briefly help set the scene, describe the current requirements as it concerns sub-vendor reporting and discuss what they mean, what it means for organizations like political ad agencies and consultancies. Sure. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Scott, for, for having me. Um, so, you know, campaign finance law not only requires disclosure for political donors, but also requires disclosure for political spending. Um, and I think that's because you know, the public has an interest in knowing not only where political money is coming from, but also uh, where it is going. Um, the, the general state of the law is that uh, campaigns, parties, and PACs uh, have to itemize all payments to vendors over $200. And then when non-political committees like dark money groups run political ads, they're also required to disclose the vendors that they paid for those ads. Um, but if the vendor then subcontracts with a third party, then the, the campaign or the PAC or the reporting entity generally does not have to separately disclose uh, the vendor's payments to third parties. So you know, the probably most classic example of this is that if a campaign hires a consulting firm to produce its ads, and then the consulting firm subcontracts with the videographer to film the ads, uh, the campaign need only report the payment to the consulting firm and not separately itemize the payments to the videographer. Um, and this is not a new interpretation. You know, this is a long-standing interpretation of the law, um, going back to an FEC advisory opinion uh, issued in the in the 1970s. Um, so we'll talk more about the problems with this later. Um, I think the probably most notorious example of a campaign trying to exploit this loophole is the Trump campaign uh, in the 2020 election. Uh, they disguised over $769 million in campaign spending uh, by only disclosing payments to vendors closely associated with the campaign and not disclosing where that money ultimately went. Um, so our view is that the campaign violated the law and we can talk more about that, but you know, in the context of digital advertising, in the context of the conversation today, you know, this lack of sub-vendor reporting makes it nearly impossible to track campaign digital spending. Um, and you know, this is a problem that I'll note at the outset that really doesn't exist to the same degree with, with TV and radio ads, um, because the, an FEC report disclosing a TV ad buy you know, doesn't really tell you anything additional than you would get with an FEC report disclosing a digital ad buy. Um, both of them are only going to tell you that the, the campaign paid a digital, pay, paid a consulting firm um, to produce or place the ads. Um, but there is a separate Federal Communications Commission, FCC, disclosure requirement that is helpful here um, because under FCC requirements, an advertiser who buys broadcast ads files a report with the station disclosing the amount spent. And then broadcast ads more generally are publicly disseminated, they're widely available. So if you, if you do see a $1 million TV ad buy on an FEC report, there are other public resources that you can draw from um, that will help you track where that money ultimately went on which stations the ads actually ran. Um, and outside of Facebook and Google, which voluntarily make analogous information public, that's not really the case uh, with, with digital ads. Um, so I'll pause, I'll pause there and we can talk a lot more about the problems arising from that uh, in, a, in a bit. Great, yeah, thank you, Brendan. That was, that was, that was great, that was, that was uh, uh, incredibly detailed. But uh, uh, Chair Broussard, I'd, I'd love to give you a chance to sort of add anything to what Brendan said. 
Um, but then I'd also love to hear how you see this issue broadly fitting into the FEC's you know, new priorities. Okay, well, thank you very much also for inviting me to be a part of this today. Um, I wanna say first that Brendan um, did a great job of covering the basics. It's kind of ironic that of all the years that I've been there, we've never actually had a chance to meet in person. So this is our in-person opportunity. So I say hello to, to Brendan. Um, as usual, he has a great grasp of everything and it's, we always enjoy the benefit of his wisdom, whether he's appearing at a witness at rule makings or filing complaints on behalf of the organization for important campaign finance issues. But he covered the basics, so I wanna drone down a little bit more. As he already mentioned, um, campaign committees and persons have to file reports uh, when they itemize certain disbursements over $200. And you have to make sure that you include the, provide the name and the address of the recipient, the date and the amount of the purpose. It's really that simple. The statute doesn't say anything about whether, um, whether you should include information regarding a sub vendor. But when you go to the issue of defining the purpose, the commission decided over four decades ago that purpose means a brief description of how the disbursement was made. Um, it provided some specific examples that were satisfactory at the time, and it did lose the word media. Of course, that was back at the time when TV, well, political ads were mainly on TV or in radio, but obviously with the proliferation of the internet and age and social media, I'm not sure that media can be uh, any longer is sufficiently descriptive if it ever was. So there's a mention of an AO. So the AO specifically is the Mondale for President AO. And during that one, the commission permitted a presidential campaign committee to simply identify the consulting company it was using and not the vendors or the agents that it would use. And that was because as long as they could show it was separate and distinct and that uh, it was an arm's length um, contract negotiation with the consultant, um, that they had other clients and they didn't dedicate its full efforts to the committee, then it would be okay to list that. But the commission has done some additional things since that time. Um, we've had a statement of policy on the purpose of disbursements that was done in 2007. That resulted in a more comprehensive list of the adequate and adequate description purposes. Um, but that policy did not remove or alter any of the purpose descriptions that were already there. So it did still include media as an adequate term. And then, which gets a little bit more specific about what we're here for today, in 2013, the commission issued an interpretive rule um, regarding the ultimate payee to ensure that original vendors and original purposes would be disclosed. But that was only gonna be listed in three specific instances. And in those instances, it was gonna be when it's reimbursement, for example, a staffer used personal funds to pay for a vendor, um, when a credit card was used to make payments, or when an authorized committee and the candidate in turn was making some expenditures on behalf of his committee. And while we even have all of that, we have had some MERS that do show that the commission is very serious about the purpose disclosures. Um, one of those is gonna be MERS 6724, which you have to go onto our website to be able to find this, but it's called Bachman for President. And that was where a consultant was a state Senator and he didn't want his name to show up on the records. So he used another consultant as the, the individual that was the, the purpose listed. And that was an incorrect purpose. So that did result in a conciliation moment. So I just want all of that to reflect that the commission is very serious about to, that the proper disclosure. But to get to your particular question, Scott, regarding the, how it's gonna fit into our current priorities, um, I could certainly envision this as part of a larger effort to fill in reporting gaps um, that have been built, revealed through efforts, efforts such as yours. Um, the advent of the internet and digital advertising age, it creates challenges that weren't anticipated when this, the app was passed in 1970. Um, so I just think that's the kind of the broader perspective. We obviously can see an issue and thank you for highlighting those issues for us today. Great, that was, that was, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, now I, I do wanna turn to, to talk kind of more specifically about some of the different problems that do arise from, from the, the current kind of uh, uh, requirements around, around reporting. And uh, um, now, so I'll say, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, my own interest in this topic was piqued when, you know, I realized that it, it, it would get in the way of my ability to study and understand in detail uh, federal advertising spending. Um, uh, but, you know, as I continue to look, kind of look more closely at it, I saw that it, there were some other kind of big issues that, that seemed to be arising from it. And so um, with that, uh, to tend to actually, I'd, I'd love to pull you in and I was wondering if you could, if you could share maybe your experience with the, the LLC loophole with this 
lack of some sub vendor reporting requirements uh, and talk about how it has influenced uh, your work. Sure. Um, so it has less impact on my current work, but in my past life, I have been a consultant at a digital ad agency. And I also was at Facebook while it was implementing a lot of the transparency measures. And as a salesperson for democratic politics, my role was to help um, my clients who were the committees, the candidates, and also the agencies that serve them learn how to use the platform with all of the transparency requirements, um, as well as field any and all of their questions about it. Um, and so it, it's been, I think a really, I've had a lot of different ways of looking at this and have a couple of different perspectives as to, you know, why it may not be in the best business interest of an agency to have that information public. Because um, while this has existed for television advertisers, this level of transparency, what it also does, um, especially in digital begin to give away a bit is some agency secret sauce or um, the strategies that they use that they in turn, you know, sell to their clients to say, this is how we will make you most successful. So there's like a level um, of unwillingness to want to reveal that. Right. And it was a big thing that I saw when we were revealing at Facebook, the transparency efforts, there were a lot of questions around what are you going to display in terms of targeting? What are you going to display in terms of cost? What are you going to display in terms of creative variations? Um, you know, and for a, a platform like Facebook, you have to remember it's not just Facebook that has the ads. It is Facebook, it is Instagram. It was audience network until they took that away. <laughs> um, so there's a wide variety of places the ads could be shown that aren't necessarily within the ad or the app that you think it is. Um, and so that just presents a whole other case. And also where does the burden lie for reporting, right? If you're an agency and there is a new requirement for you to show where the ads are, does that sit with your client? Does it sit with you? Um, as an agency, you do have easily where all of the ads went and how much was spent because that media plan is owed to your client in most cases. Um, but should the client report it? Should you? <laughs> is it the platform's responsibility? Um, there are a lot of questions that would come into play with how it is implemented. And it's why I feel very strongly um, with a number of, you know, attempts for federal regulation that they actually aren't being written in a way that actually achieves what the goal of that is. And I, I'm not necessarily sure that the folks who are writing those laws have enough knowledge about digital advertising and platform to responsibly regulate it so that they are asking for actions that result in the transparency that they desire. Great. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to follow up on that because that, 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 that's a um, yeah, that, that's too intriguing of, 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 of a point that you just made. So I'd love to hear a little bit more kind of, you know, detail about what, what, what specifically you mean there. So let's take, for instance, if we're going to be saying that we want to make sure that people know who paid for an advertisement, that's the basic goal of, let's say, the Honest Ads Act, right? We want people to know who paid for the ad. The act, I believe, as written, mandates that at the end of the 30 second or 15 second spot, there is a disclosure as to who paid for it. With most digital advertising, you self-select into viewing that full ad. So you have the option to not necessarily view the full ad, which means that the only way that you can guarantee that someone knows who paid for it is if the disclosure is at the top of the ad or within the advertising unit itself. It actually does not accomplish anything. And in fact, if I were a political consultant for a dark money group, of which I, I have been, um, I would make sure everybody just put it at the end of the ad and as quiet of sound as possible, like, you know, to make sure it wasn't seen if that was the goal. But if you're thinking about, I want someone to know, you have to put the disclosure either within the initial framework of the impression, meaning when the ad is seen by someone in those initial pieces of either creative or text that's seen, or at the very beginning of the ad so that the first two seconds of audio is truly who paid for it. Um, or even if you're thinking about pricing disclosures, the goal is for people to know how much was paid for an ad. Ads are bought in a really weird way by cost per mille or CPM, or they could be bought on a cost per view. What determines a view? That changes by platform. What determines a completion? That's determined by platform cost per acquisition. What's the full acquisition? It ranges by platform. So if you're saying that a platform has to disclose how much the cost of the ad was, that's a really complicated question that could be diced a thousand different ways. 
And so is the goal for us to say that we want to know that for this specific message and all iterations that it could appear, which it could be hundreds, that $2 million was spent because I could think through probably 200 permutations of ways to break down that cost. And it would mean nothing to anyone who wasn't familiar. Great, Th thanks for, for clarifying that. Um, I think we'll come back a little bit to, to some of the difficulties as it relates to, to digital ads, maybe, maybe in a minute. Um, but before we kind of leave talking about, you know, really identifying some of the, the, the problems that arise from, from just this issue of sub, sub vendor reporting, I, I want to give Brendan a chance to, to come back to, uh, um, to talk a little bit more about, about the complaint that CLC filed uh, uh, last year. And uh, um, yeah, so, so uh, Brendan, if you'd love to, to maybe tell us a, uh, about the contents of the complaint and kind of how it relates to this topic. Sure. Um, so... You know, I, I think this is an example of how the, the problems that arise from sub-vendor reporting are, are not limited to uh, tracking digital advertising. So, you know, as Cher Broussard mentioned, um, you know, that this, this um, sub-vendor reporting loophole is not a, a categorical, categorical exception. Um, if a vendor is just acting as a conduit hide the ultimate recipients of the campaign spending, then, then the campaign is violating the law. Um, and, and Chair Broussard mentioned uh, one case where the commission had found a, a campaign to have violated the law. Um, and that was one where uh, Michelle Bachman's presidential campaign paid a state senator for an endorsement, um, which itself did not necessarily violate the law. But what violated the law is that the money was routed through conduits that were closely associated with the campaign and, and senior campaign officials. Um, and there was another case um, involving the Ron Paul campaign, uh, Ron Paul presidential campaign in 2012, uh, where they actually tried to pay the same Iowa state senator for an endorsement and similarly uh, tried to keep the payments off the books by routing the money through, through conduits. So there is some precedent of uh, the commission finding that this, this loophole is not entirely categorical. Um, and where we think that applies with the Trump campaign is that uh, the, the Trump campaign in 2020 uh, routed uh, the majority of its spending through largely through one firm, American made media consultants that was created and managed by Trump campaign officials. Um, we were able to identify through, through other means, some of the recipients of the ultimate recipients of those payments. Um, they included some Trump family members like Lara Trump. Um, it included uh, a, um, a firm called Funware, which was responsible for setting up the Trump campaign's app. Um, it included a, uh, a digital consulting firm run by a senior Trump campaign official. Um, but we really don't know where the, the majority of the Trump campaign's money went. It just reported you know, around $769 million in payments to American Made. Um, and there's no disclosure of where that money really went. And we think that violated the law um, you know, based on the, you know, the Bachman and the Ron Paul and related precedents from the FEC. And, and ultimately, you know, if the, the vendor that is receiving the disclosed payment does not have an arm's length relationship with the committee um, and where the vendor is just acting as, as a conduit for the disbursements to, to, to the sub vendors um, and the sub vendors are actually working under the direction or control of the campaign you know, rather than working um, on behalf of the vendor, you know, then the campaign has violated the law by not disclosing payments to those, to those sub vendors. Um, and I think this also touches on, this case also touches on Part of why it's important, um, or part of the part of the problems that arise um, from the lack of of sub vendor reporting. Um, so, just one example in this case, you know that there is evidence that the Trump campaign was paying family members uh, through American Made and another LLC called Parscale Strategy. Um, we don't know how much they were paid, um, and that could actually disguise potential legal violations because excess payments to a candidate's family members, um, just like excess payments to uh, a candidate's business that he owns could violate the law. And we don't know how much the, the Trump campaign may have paid family members or may have paid Trump organization properties. Um, you know, and this, is, and th this particular case um, stepped, over, stepped over a legal line, but there are plenty of other examples of, um, of campaigns or political committees that 
have effectively disguised a significant portion of their spending, um, leaving the public in the dark about where that money is ultimately going. Um, you know, one example that has attracted uh, some attention recently is the Lincoln Project. Um, the Lincoln Project, the, the anti-Trump group that raised and spent tens of millions of dollars um, opposing Trump, most of that money was paid to consulting firms run by the run by the Lincoln Pro, run by run by Lincoln Project officials, um, and those there's no evidence that those payments violated the law. But we don't know of, of the amount of the tens of millions of dollars paid to these consulting firms by the Lincoln Project. We don't know how much money went to TV ads, how much went to digital ads, and how much went to um, payments to to those individuals and to those officials. Um, so I'll pause there, but I think there are a lot of other sort of cascading problems that can come from, that can arise from the lack of lack of transparency. Great, Th thanks for that. Uh, Chair Broussard, I, I, um, I understand that you're you know, limited in, in what you can talk about as it relates to the complaint and, and ongoing investigations, but you know, um, you know, clearly, you know, the sort of like underlying, uh, um, you know, harms that, that we're really talking about here has to do with sort of impairing political transparency in, in general. And um, so maybe you can help us sort of understand a little bit better the centrality of transparency to US election regulation. Um, and then maybe you could also talk about uh, a, a bit about how else uh, you see the FEC kind of pursuing additional transparency uh, uh, initiatives. Thank you. Well, of course, I will not be able to comment on any complaint that might have been submitted to the agency, but as it turns to your particular question, Scott, um, as, as everyone here already knows, transparency is the core mission of the FEC. And more precisely, as I think everyone can agree, our main job is to inform the public about the amounts of money, uh, the amounts and the sources of the money raised and spent on federal elections. Because the more information that a voter has, about who has contributed to the candidates on the ballot and in what amounts, what super PACs are running ads for or against those candidates, the more democracy is enhanced. So the very existence of the FEC is tied to the Watergate scandal of the early 70s, which basically uncovered a scheme that involved secret illegal donations to the Nixon campaign. And this scandal was briefly highlighted with the recent passing of G. Gordon Liddy, I believe uh, earlier this week, um, to who we all owe a small debt of gratitude um, because if not for a bungled break-in into the Watergate Hotel almost 50 years ago, I don't know that I would be sitting here at this position that I am right now. We might not even have an FEC. So in the aftermath of Watergate, Congress recognized that a properly functioning democracy requires a well-informed public and that citizens should know how money is being used to influence elections. And they should be armed with that knowledge when they cast their votes during a federal election or at a federal election, excuse me. So. I, again, this goes back to thank you for shining a light on these potential gaps in the various disclosure regimes, whether they exist at a federal level over which my agency has jurisdiction or pursuant to the policies of major digital platforms that accept political advertising. Um, I hate to say this, but in many ways, we are kind of stuck with the laws that were passed in an era that was devoid of technology. So the Watergate scandal involves secret accounts and payments made in cashier's checks, as opposed to fake Facebook ads and other fraudulent internet schemes funded by a Russian government. So I, I realize that it can be very frustrating to review our reports on a website expecting to be able to exactly pinpoint how much campaign money was spent on Facebook ad and purchases only to see vague descriptions like digital advertising or simply advertising. So I, I just think it simply comes down to as I fully support all available options to increase the level of transparency. Um, at the FEC, we're always looking for ways of within the confines of the acts and regulations, of course, to pursue additional transparency and public disclosure. And this includes everything from the current internet disclaimer, internet communications disclaimer rulemaking to improvements in our website to make sure that report processing gets easily searchable so that we can look at our websites and our forms and, and be able to have a clear understanding of how things are filed. And, I, ultimately, it just comes down to, as I started off, is that Americans deserve to know who is trying to influence our elections. And as a commissioner, I take responsibility for shining a light on this, uh, these issues in any way that I can. Thank you.
Great, thanks so much for that. Um, now I, I wanna turn a little bit uh, to the last two questions which deal a little bit more with, with kind of solutions and, and, and Chair Broussard, you, you kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, now there've been kind of a number of different proposals that have been floated you know, about you know, correcting this issue. Um, but in fact, two, two states, Washington and California have already uh, uh, amended their political reporting requirements of uh, requiring uh, committees to report sub vendor spending um, so Jordan, I'd, I'd love to hear from you now. Um, I know you've worked, you've done work in both states. And so I'd love to sort of, uh, if you could tell us more about these state level initiatives and describe your own experience with them. What, what does this look like in, in practice? It's much less exciting, Scott, than you, you might imagine. Um, in practice, uh, when the campaign is over, uh, an expensive lawyer will ask us uh, for the sub vendor report for our digital buying. Uh, we will send a spreadsheet with a list of vendors and an amount of dollars uh, associated with that. Uh, the reporting regime in Washington is a little more onerous, um, but you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's much more routine and much less controversial than you might expect. It's boring, to be honest. Um, it doesn't change anything in terms of our pricing, our execution. Um, what it does change is that threat to our business model that Tatendo was referring to. This is our trade craft is emerging. So the tools that we use are secret. And that is how I've been able to build our business for the last 10 years, because I'm able to find a new vendor that doing, that's doing something interesting and cutting edge that is privacy conscious, privacy centric. Um, by putting that on the list of things I used, I end my business overnight. So that's a very important distinction between protecting the trade craft but also providing the transparency that uh, Chairman Broussard and Brendan are talking about. It is very important. I have kids in this country. I wanna raise kids in a, in a democracy that, you know, that, that is functioning and is transparent. It's very important to me. I love elections more than I love you know, perhaps anything else. And uh, trying to find that, that difference between protecting the business and innovation and protect you know, that ingenuity and, and the changes going on in our system are, are really important. Many of the uh, innovations that we come up with in political on the political side do end up kind of on that commercial side as well. So that innovation that we're developing in politics really does kind of feed into the you know the innovation that we're seeing nationwide in digital targeting. Um, so it is very important to, to pull apart the you know that punitive. I want to know where you know where these presidential campaigns spent their money versus you know I need to know where every one of the tens of thousands of candidates spent their money on direct mail printing or things. And one thing that, that I do want to mention before we move on is that the California law specifically was intended to prevent um, paying family members as sub vendors. Uh, the, the, the intent was to stop, you know, a campaign from paying a spouse through the printer, say something like that. Nobody supports that, right? So that is very different than me telling you which demand side platform I'm using. And not only which demand side platform I'm using, but in a programmatic sense, which 50,000 websites did I buy on? There's, there's a point where it becomes, you know, not only onerous, um, not only on my end, but also these legal bills on smaller campaigns can get excessive. So, you know, at the end of the day, a lawyer says, what's your spreadsheet look like? Here you go. But, you know, taken to an extreme, it can get uh, somewhat uh, weighty. Great, thanks. Yeah. Um, so Tatenda, uh, uh, I'd love to hear from you right now, and and uh, I'm I'm sure you have a lot to say about what, what Jordan just said, but but um, I also uh, want to pull in a question that that has been asked by by um, several people in the audience uh, now and, and before um, about the and, and you kind of mentioned it already, but uh, the, the the role that platforms might play as it relates to providing some additional kind of uh, uh, transparency about digital ad ad buys. Um, yeah, so to what degree can we rely on, on, you know, platform ad archives, for example, to fill in some of these gaps in transparency? I love them. They are my favorite stalking tool known, like, I love them. I spend more time in them than most people, I'm sure. And the, the other thing was working there, I love them because then I wasn't, I didn't have as many secrets, you know, um, I could just tell people to go look in the archive for what they were looking for. A lot of times people wanted competitive reports, go look in the archive or, you know, clients wanted to see if their agency's ads went live on time, go look in the archive. Um, so I think they're a really, really great tool. I think what can get confusing is that all of the archives act differently and they have different rules for inclusion. They have different rules for reporting and they have different levels of accessibility as to what you can see. Um, 
I would say Facebook's is probably the most comprehensive and also controversial because it includes issue ad spending. Much of the issue ad spending is commercial because, you know, if you're Patagonia and you're running an ad about the environment, which they do frequently because that company has within its mission to preserve and protect the environment, all of their ads where they talk about climate are going to end up in the archive. Um, but at the same time, that also allows us to see um, ads about climate um, advocacy on both ends of the spectrum within it. And that may not be under the purview of the FCC if that's not being run by a, a candidate or um, committee, or it's running being run at the state level. Um, but you know that isn't the case on Google. Google only runs ads for um, candidates and committees within their platform. And Snapchat is a bit in between the two. Um, and so I think they're really, really excellent tools that help people learn about you know, <laughs> uh, what's being run, what the discourse of political ads are. But again, when I talk about like cost or what types of messages are running, it can get convoluted in there because it, it did strike a balance with, um, you know, advertisers proprietary information, but also being transparent. But I highly recommend everyone to be in there a lot. If you're very interested, if they're fun places to be. Uh, Chair Broussard, I'd actually love to, to follow up on that by asking about the, the um, I guess, the possibility of, of FEC working with some of this, the, the different platforms kind of more directly um, uh, as it relates to, to, to their, their ad archives. Uh, is this something that y'all are doing? Is this something that there's any possibility of? Um, I'd love to. So I... It's not something that I can offhand say that we're doing. Uh, I am happy to, to pull in our, our tech expert who might be able to answer that in some way if she has any information. And I think our tech ex expert is, is, is on, on with us. So Laura, if you have any information, feel free to, to jump on and join us. Um, so while she processes that and decides if she's gonna join us, excuse me, because the work is never ending if you hear my email pinging, so I apologize about that. Um, so. While she goes that, to go to something else that Tutende kind of mentioned, and also to go to your other question regarding the Washington and the California, I just wanna say that I think that both of those are great examples of how states can address the disclosure gaps that are highlighted in the discussion today. Um, in some ways, certain state agencies have a greater latitude than the FEC does, but I wanna go back when your question into solving the issue or, or kind of looking how we can kind of what steps can be taken. So the commission on its own initiative or in response to a request for a rulemaking can start the process to amend any existing rule or promulgate new rules. Um, but it's a long process and it requires a lot of compromise across the aisles and every step of the way from drafting the, the notice of proposed rulemaking, soliciting comments, um, hearings if we choose to have that, uh, drafting of final rules, even the ENJs that go along with it. But I, I also wanna highlight um, while it shouldn't surprise you all that it takes a long time, I also want to say any private citizen or groups that have an interest in an issue, you can petition the commission for rulemaking to start one. It, it's quite simple process. Um, you just basically identify yourself as the petitioner. You select the portions of the regulations that are affected, the facts and legal support for the proposed action, and even include the desired regulatory, regulatory language. So. I just want to say that while it seems that you there's a lot of delay on what could act, it, it also anyone out there that has particular concern, particularly as we're talking about these sub vendors, take advantage of the opportunity to reach out to the commission. But as it relates to the digital platforms that you mentioned, um, whether the FEC is working directly with it, I do not have a specific answer for that. But I do think this all kind of goes back to um, HR1 or S1. Um, look for modifications there, there could be that has a setup employed to, to be able to do those very type of things. And I definitely think there's ways to work on modifying that legislation, proposed legislation, to include those corrections for these sub vendor modifications that you're looking for. So thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, I don't know if Laura wants to um, add anything to that. Um... Uh, sure. Hello, everybody. I'm the technical lead for the FEC.gov FEC and our campaign finance data API. Um, thanks for the opportunity to address the technical support issue. Um, we have had uh, platforms reach out to us for support in using our API to validate political spending. Um, 
I don't know if it's been uh, from a from a technical perspective. Um, we they've reached out to us directly, and um, one of the vendors, uh, one of the platforms, uh, was very interesting. They were asking for advice on how to um, validate the identity of folks who are buying political ads to make sure they were in fact associated with the campaign. And the um, initial uh, thought was to upload a statement of the a copy of the statement of organization, the form one, but that's publicly available information. So um, I was able to um, make some recommendations on how they might um, verify identity of individuals. And, and we've have we have had camp campaigns reach out to update their records with the FEC as part of their ad buying process. Um, so that is something that we're happy to help the platforms do. Great, that's fascinating. Yeah, thank thank you so much for that. Um, all right, in our in uh, before we in our remaining time before the audience we get into the audience Q and I, I really want to um, uh, kind of come back to you know this point that Jordan made, you know, about the sort of thinking about the the different kind of harms and and the different benefits that would come along with with changing the regulations. And uh, um, so I'll, I'll, um, I'm happy to, I think I'll, I'll pass it back to Jordan and, and maybe he can give us a little bit more detail about uh, really what exactly it would mean if on the federal level, you know, agencies were required to report um, all of the sub vendors that, 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 that they use. How, how exactly would that impact your, 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 your business, your, your ability to, to, to have a company? So. That's a, thanks Scott. So there's obviously a, um, a range for reporting. Um, if we're if we're talking about categorig categorization of um, different types of media, so digital, direct mail, and, and things like that in the sub vendor space, particularly on presidential campaigns or multi million dollar operations, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think it's a little more digestible. Um, but uh, if you take it to the extreme, particularly in a, in a in a programmatic buying tool, we are literally buying 10, 20, 100,000 different ads. Uh, websites. We, you know, in some cases by accident have been, you know, asked for a list of every single website where we spent more than one cent. Um, so if you get all the way down to the extreme, not only are we uh, making it virtually impossible for me to operate my business because I'm, all, all I'm doing is reporting, um, the, I'm eliminating, the, we're eliminating the trade craft of this, is, which is where we built the business, but you're also creating tremendous legal work or paperwork for these, for these campaigns, many of which are underfunded. So you know, there's a, there is a, a cost and a benefit to providing Scott more information for you. And I completely understand why you would want to know where a presidential campaign is spending, you know, some huge percentage of its money. Um, but you have to remember that that's one campaign out of tens of thousands. And I, I'd like to recommend avoiding punishing the other tens of thousands of campaigns with giant legal bills and ruining a whole vertical of business and, and, and kind of taking away that innovation. Um, just to provide more information for something that that is probably probably very interesting. Um, so again, there's there's large campaigns, there's categorization issues, um, but the reality is not every campaign is Donald Trump or Joe Biden. The reality is most campaigns are going to be much smaller. We ran uh, approximately five thousand different political digital engagements last year. Forty seven hundred of them were non. -fed. So thinking about all these things down market, you know, if we had to follow the California and the Washington state laws it would be very difficult to operate this business and do these innovative things and help advocate for our clients. Yeah. So I'll just open this up to anyone on the panel. Um, I, I, I would like to, you know, really kind of di discuss this point. Um, so uh, if anyone wants to jump in, uh, respond to what Jordan said or offer their own sort of sense of, you know, how, you know, balancing the sort of uh, uh, costs and benefits of, of uh, making these sort of changes. So I thought not to jump ahead of anyone, but if you break it down to the advantages and disadvantages, um, I'll take the advantages first. The advantages is that we have transparency, uh, which goes to what I said, at least to a healthier democracy. But I definitely see the disadvantages that Jordan mentioned. Um, we have to work on making sure we balance the interest in improving transparency and preventing corruption on one hand and avoid inhibiting core First Amendment core protected speech on the other. But I think there's also the issue, and it's a really big issue that I'm concerned with about the additional burdens on the committees. Um, I think Jordan's point is excellent about there being small committees because we're so used to hearing about the big committees that, um, the big dollar committees, and particularly thinking in the sense that the 2020 election versus the 2018 election had 138% 
increase in spending. But that wasn't all those, it's not just the big ones that were doing it. It's the little committees that are spending as well, even though we have big dollar committees. Um, I think do you really have to look at the fact from an FEC perspective, we're gonna talk about longer reports, we're gonna talk about it, um, it does increase the time for not so much the data to become immediately available, but for the processing in the sense of having um, a, a greater use of the material in, in those reports coming through. But I think ultimately when it comes down to it, the advantage for me outweighs the disadvantage so that we can have a fuller and more, ro more robust um, democracy that we can really see how funds are being spent. So that's that's how I say it. I definitely understand the disadvantages as Jordan mentioned, and I can definitely appreciate them from um, the perspective of being at the commission. So thank you. Uh, to tend to not to not to uh, uh, put you on the spot here, but but uh, I'd lo I'd love to sort of get your sense of of this. Um, you know, uh, you know, as someone who has worked uh, in in a lot of different roles, kind of in this space. Um, yeah, what, what is your sense of, of of you know do do the do the advantages that we gain towards transparency and 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 in potentially preventing or at least being able to to prosecute you know gross gross abuses of of, uh, of of the regulations outweigh the sort of day to day challenges and 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 that 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 it might raise? Yeah, I um Jordan, you're lovely, but. <laughs> I definitely fall on the on the side of transparency. I, I think that I just have less of um, empathy is probably the right word for um, the pieces about strategy that relates to agencies. I think there's a very good point about the cost of being able to do the reporting um, because I don't necessarily think that burden should fall to the sub vendor. Um, I, I think that burden should fall to the campaign to be aware of where their money's being spent and report it accordingly. Um, but I, I do think that it is to everyone's benefit, including the actual market of camp agencies to have that transparency because it forces more competition, which ideally results in better services across the board for every single candidate who's going to access those services. So um, I, I tend to believe that I think we need to be careful about, you know, how it is that we do the reporting and um, the liability of that. So as to be aware as to how much it is impacting some of these sub vendors, especially those who serve the smallest um, clients. But at the same time, um, I, I think there's a lot to be gained for campaigns themselves if we have full transparency so that every agency can go look at what every other agency is doing and force um, each other to level up. Uh, but you, you made a really interesting. Uh, we made several really interesting points, but but I, I think uh, um, your your point about the the uh, um, sort of increased transparency actually aiding competition as it relates to the work of agencies is a really interesting interesting point. Because um, in, in fact, it, it's, it's a total sort of counterbalance to what Jordan just said, right? If Jordan just said that opening things up would totally undercut the ability of, of this company or, you know, uh, their sorts of companies to, to have a sort of competitive advantage. You're actually saying that, no, it, it, like having that sort of transparency about the, the sub vendors that, that different consultancies or agencies are using would actually in, like in, you know, help the health of the of, of the of the environment kind of more broadly. Um, for, first, am I is that is that what you meant? I hope I'm not like totally butchering what, what you. No, just said. I think that's right. And you also have to remember, I'm coming from a very very unique perspective where I think there are less than thirty people <laughs> in the United States who have the experience that I do of sitting with one of the largest vendors and watching every single campaign come in from across most major agencies that do the work, and seeing what happens across them. And you know, you have to. Hold Hold that information in because your clients deserve privacy but at the same time you do see a lot going on and my key takeaway from all three and a half years i spent there was i would love for there to be more transparency across the board as to what different agencies and people who buy media are doing because i think that in turn would help it would definitely help with the services available and i think it would help keep more businesses accountable um, to the novelty of their strategies or to the proprietariness of their strategies? Or, you know, is that proprietariness just asking your Facebook agency what, <laughs> what they should do? Is it asking the Facebook lady what the best 
like uh, solution is for the problem solved or the problem presented for that agency. Um, it's a unique perspective and it's frankly a very weird one to be in, but that's the one of the biggest takeaways I took from that work along with knowing a lot more about FEC rules than I ever wanted to and being here, so. <laughs> Uh, would anyone else like to, to, to kind of weigh in on, on, on this issue before we, we go to the audience Q&A? Um, and which, which I'll just give you a preview, is going to probably broaden out a little bit more than, than just this narrow kind of focus on, on some vendor uh, reporting regulations. Yeah, just one um, piece to add, um, you know, just a, a reminder that the, you know, the value of having greater "Quote unquote," sub vendor reporting is not limited to the the digital space. Um, you know, from our perspective, from Campaign Legal Center's perspective, where you know, we're actively looking for potential violations of campaign finance law, um, these kinds of disclosures can help to identify those violations. Um, I gave the one example of um, detecting potential excess payments to candidates or family members. You know, when that's when that's um, hidden. Um, by only disclosing payments to vendors and not disclosing payments to the ultimate recipients of the money, you know, it becomes almost impossible to identify those potential violations of campaign finance laws, personal use ban. Um, you know, similarly, uh, when you're thinking about potential coordination between campaigns and super PACs, one way that that coordination can be established is through the use of common vendors, where both the campaign and the super PAC are contracting with the same vendor. Um, but if the payments to that common vendor are hidden um, or are laundered through an intermediary, you know, identifying violations of the, the FEC's common vendor coordination rules becomes you know, next, to, next to impossible. Um, and then there's also the broader category of disclosures that, that may not violate the law or payments, I'm sorry, the, the broader ca category of payments that, that may not violate the law but are of significant interest to the public and significant interest to, to voters. Um, I mentioned the Lincoln Project, um, and there's questions about where their money ultimately went. I think the, the Lincoln Project's donors likely would want to know um, how their mo money was ultimately spent. Um, another recent example, uh, last week, the FEC um, spent a lot of time dealing with this very difficult issue of how campaigns can pay for security services. And there was you know, justifiable concern about campaigns spending money on payments to militia groups or Proud Boys, for example. Um, but if that does happen, I think the, the public would want to know about it. Um, and the way that they would know about it is through the disclosure on the FEC report of the payments to the Proud Boys or the Oath Keepers. Um, but if that payment, again, is laundered through some sort of an intermediary, um, the public would not know about the payment. Um, they would not be able to you know, hold the candidates accountable for how they're spending their money and who they're ultimately associating with. Um, so I think there's a lot of benefits that could flow from increased, increased disclosure here and that are not limited to just to digital. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, does anyone want to follow up on that? Um, great. Well, in that case, um, let's turn to the audience Q&A. We have a lot of really interesting questions. And um, the first one I want to start off with um, is actually sort of a follow-up to, to something that Chair Broussard said a few minutes ago. Um, and Jane Preston asks, uh, what can an average citizen do to fight this big money influence? How can we encourage the FEC to better regulate? And Chair Broussard, yeah, you, you mentioned that, well, I'll, I'll let you uh, um, follow up on that. Um, <laughs> I, I was about to say something, if you see something, say something, it is what to, to take one of those little quotes that we hear out a lot. Um, what I wanna say is, is that if you, the, the process that I mentioned before, if you think that there should be a change in the law and we have not gotten to it yet, then feel free to petition to file a, a rulemaking. Um, Brandon mentioned that he is with an organization that takes a lead on when they see that there are believe is violations of campaign finance, they file a complaint. An individual can file a complaint on their own if they believe that they've witnessed or see or aware of a campaign finance violation, take advantage of your right to do so. I personally, having been with the FEC for 13 years and more of them as an attorney as opposed to being a commissioner, um, quite a few more of them as an attorney as, than as a commissioner, um, I have had complaints that were a handwritten letter from an individual that went all the way to litigation that had resulted in personal use violations. 
So what I say is if you believe that there is some change that needs to be done, take an active interest. That also means take an active interest, not only just the FEC, if you are supportive of HR1 um, it, or Senate 1, reach out to your representative and let them know. And this is when, as an active voter, an engaged citizen, it, it, I believe it's the responsibility to be that engaged citizen and speak. So as I started, I was being quippy, but if you see something, say something. That really is what I'm trying to say. So thank you. Anyone else want to jump on that? Um, actually, I want to say something. I'm going to use my moderator's privilege here. Um, maybe this is an answer that that uh, um, maybe people wouldn't expect, but um, I would say fund journalism. Uh, you know, I, I think we focus definitely on on the actions of of, uh, of, of federal agencies or of platforms, but we have to remember, right? Like, if we want transparency to work, like we need someone to 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 be doing it, to, to be looking, to be analyzing uh, the data that we do have. And um, you know, I'll say as a researcher, like we do some of that, but like it's it's the journalists who who really um, do such an incredibly important role uh, in 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 holding power to account. And today, right, with journalism in crisis, it's even more important that we all support uh, journalist uh, outlets that, that we, that, you know, uh, quality journalist outlets. So, all right, let's uh, go to another question. Um, a lot of people have asked about HR1 and uh, the, the sort of, uh, um, you know, more broadly than, than you know, subvent of reporting, but the, the sort of, uh, uh, you know, how HR1 may sort of in, improve the, the um, you know, uh, regulations around, around campaign finance. Anyone want to speak to that? I'll take a stab at it because I saw the question and started to do a bit more digging. And my initial thing is like, we are asking for the longest disclaimer known to man. It seems if you are trying to put in your top five donors and like a lot of rich people have the longest names ever, like that could potentially be 10 and a half seconds of just naming names and a website, um, which I don't know if that's the most efficient way to get what you need, especially if um, for a lot of the ways that the online platforms require you to disclose, it's a number of characters, much like a tweet um, where, you know, you have 15 <laughs> not 15, but maybe 150 characters to just like say who's paying for something. So I see the intent. Um, and again, the intent is to inform people about who paid for an ad, what people support your dark money ad, um, and and I guess reveal more but, or like make sure that people realize like who's who is funding something. Um, I think there are more efficient ways to do it. And I think this is another example of where I feel like sometimes the way that laws are written um, for this kind of work are not reflective of people who truly understand the actual platforms and how they work. Um, I just started a new organization, but maybe I'll volunteer myself as someone who's willing to talk about it more um, because it, it, some of that, like the intent is there and I agree with the the intent. It is the execution of how people are asking for it that I, I think is is what um, may not be the best. Yeah, and I'll um, just add to that. So, you know, in broad strokes, you know, HR1 slash S1 is a, it's a big bill, 800 page bill. Um, it addresses voting rights and redistricting and government ethics. Um, I think the, the broad categories in campaign finance are you know, one, um, reforming and restructuring the FEC uh, to, uh, to make it a, uh, to, to follow the model of agencies like the Federal Communications Commission uh, to make sure that it can function as an effective watchdog. Um, it also strengthens the laws governing coordination between super PACs and dark money groups and campaigns. Um, it creates a, uh, a small donor matching system where small donations are matched uh, six to one with funds um, drawn from a, a new account um, based on fines levied on corporate executives uh, who, who are convicted of wrongdoing. Um, and then uh, additionally, it does drastically strengthen transparency requirements. It ends dark money. And, and part of that, um, in addition to requiring disclosure of donors over $10,000 who finance a dark money group's political ads, um, there's also that requirement that Tatenda was alluding to that ads include a list of the group's top donors. Um, and I think there's, I think like Tatenda said, there's a lot, there's a significant amount of value in letting donors know, you know, effectively at the point of sale, um, who is behind the group and who is financing the group. 
um, but there are some exceptions built into the built into the for the people act that would you know make it uh some exceptions built into the for the people act that would that would accommodate um for disclaimers that would not fit on an ad that would make the make the ads uh, make the ad impossible uh to communicate if it weren't in, to include the full disclaimer Great. Any other thoughts on, on HR1? Um, great. Uh, Tatenda, I want to I want to come back to this point that you made a couple times um, about you know the need for bringing in more expertise into uh, um, uh, rulemaking in government. And I, I, I guess I want to pose this kind of question: like, how, how you know, if we if we think that like that, uh, um, that there is a lack of, of understanding about you know how digital, especially as it relates to like digital communication, uh, works in in the writing of new legislation or regulation. What are some ways that we might think about fixing that? What are some ways that we might think about like better bringing in the sort of expertise that we need to to craft the types of regulations and, and, and laws that that um, that that we want to see? I think rulemakers have to talk to the people who are actually creating the advertisements and the strategies because digital is constantly changing. I mean, constantly changing the thing that was, you know, most prevalent in 2018 was not the most prevalent in 2020. And I don't even know what's coming for 2022. You have to be able to speak to people who are entrenched in the work daily who understand trends, who understand how people consume, because I think it's hard to make laws that are designed to get people to understand something if you don't have a keen understanding of how broad swaths of your population are consuming information on these platforms. It is no longer true that like for many advertisements and even in the strategies of how television ad creators make their ads versus digital ad creators make their ads, they are not the same. I've spent way too many years of my life trying to get people to realize that you need to build your ads differently. And so if you're building your ads differently so that people understand or get the information, then you probably need to think about your rulemaking as being different. So as you are building rules that achieve the same ends, but maybe through different means because people are not consuming media the same way. We can't take it for granted that someone's gonna watch an entire ad. We can't take it for granted that people are going to see all of the major ads that a campaign could be running even on television because viewing is way more fractured than it ever has been. And so I, I wish there could be some committee of digital ad buyers somewhere that you know rule makers could tap to speak to to say hey how are you thinking about making your ads and what are we not considering in these rules because i think you could find any digital ad buyer who's two years in who could sit down and tell you like these you know 10 things are what i would do to get around this <laughs> you should consider it because if i'm thinking about it and i've been in this business for a year or two imagine people who've been in it for decades. Scott, if I could add, you know, I think when you talked about how do we educate rule makers, I think this, we do things like this. I, I mean, I, uh, Chairman Roussard, before you were there, one of my better friends in, in DC was Ann Ravel, and we spent hours at the Caribou Coffee across the street from your office. And I think I would encourage you to spend as much time with practitioners as possible before you start, you know, before you start getting into the rule making process. Thanks. Um, so there have been um, a number of questions that were submitted ahead of time that ha that ask about um, pu public financing for, for elections. And I know that's like a, a sharp left turn from what we're talking about, but but just given the sort of interest uh, in, in the audience, I, I feel like, um, uh, you know, we, we, we should talk about it. So uh, several questions about asking about uh, this sort of, you know, we'll take it as like radical changes to the ways that campaigns are, are funded. Um, if anyone has any thoughts about that, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll open the floor. So the, the question is really um, about, should we have public financing for federal campaigns? Is that the, the general thrust of these questions? Yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and uh, um, yeah, what would be the implications of doing so? Is it realistic? Um, 
Yeah. Um, well, so, you know, public financing is not, it's not a new idea. Um, we did have it uh, for presidential races for, for many years, and it is actually still in the books as Chair Broussard can attest to. Uh, there are still some presidential candidates who, who take advantage of the system. Um, but for, for many decades, the presidential candidates from, from both parties uh, took advantage of the presidential public financing system, but it became, it became outmoded as campaign practice, practices changed. Um, and then there are states like Connecticut and Arizona that also have you know, very functional uh, public financing systems. Um, what the uh, For the People Act does you know, more closely follows a program, a program like New York City's where it's, it's not a, a lump sum of money that is given to participating candidates. It's that small donations of up to $200 are matched six to one uh, with public funds. Um, and as I alluded to before, these are not taxpayer funds. They are uh, public funds that are drawn from a, a new freedom from influence fund that is um, that derives its financing from a surcharge on fines levied against uh, corporate executives and corporations that are engaged in, in wrongdoing. Um, so there's really no, no impact on taxpayers when it comes to this, comes to this system. Um, and what it would do and what the idea of this uh, small donor matching program is, is to you know, amplify the voices of small donors and thereby, thereby uh, limit the reliance of candidates on big donors, the big donors who can write thousands and thousands of dollar checks. Um, and that frees candidates from the fundraising pressures that just about all of them are complaining about, the amount of time that they have to spend fundraising, uh, the, the pressure that they feel to act on behalf of the interests of uh, a small handful of big donors. Um, and it also broadens and diversifies the donor class. Um, because it means that candidates can rely on you know, a, small, a large number of small dollar donors uh, who are much more representative of the country as a whole rather than you know, a small handful of, of big donors who largely are not representative. Um, so you know, that's, the general, that's the general idea. And it, I think it has worked really well in uh, the places where, where it's been tried. Um, I'm happy to answer more questions about that. I'd just like to add. I think I think that fixing on the fixing the the, the revenue side is far more important than the expenditure side, uh, given what we saw in the last election cycle. Um, the one thing, as a practitioner, what I see is that, and I want to just mention when we're talking about how about how to deal with public financing in the New York City system, is that small donor donations, smaller donors, may be in many cases more polarized than large donors. So I understand why there's an attraction towards the masses, but when you look at how do you raise $10 from a group of people on the left or the right, typically that's a very polarizing outbound message. So if you're gonna say something pretty strong, you're gonna get a lot of donations. Um, you know, and I'm not necessarily saying that's a, that's a bad idea, but, but you wanna be mindful that you're going, you may be, the, the way to game the system in New York City is to say some really crazy things and I'm not sure necessarily that you're gonna you're gonna win that battle, and it's gonna it may have unintended consequences. Yeah, and there's and this is an active um, area of research, and I think there's there's evidence that cuts that cuts both ways. You know, some of the looking at the federal level, um, some of the candidates who received the the greatest number of small dollar donations in in the 2020 race. Uh, were candidates in swing districts. And in many cases, those were very, very moderate candidates. Um, moderate candidates received a lot, of, a lot of small dollar donations because the stakes in their race were high and because they had higher, higher name recognition. Um, so I think it's an area of, certainly an area of ongoing academic research. Great. Um, you know, we just have a couple minutes left and, and a lot of the questions that, that have been posed, uh, especially before are these huge topics that I don't necessarily think that we can address things like fact checking political ads. Um, but but uh, I'll just I'll just pick a couple here that, that are kind of interesting. Uh, someone asks about um, the possibility of banning all political ads just days before an election. And, and I, I think I, I'm, 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 I want to ask this because I, I, I like these sort of uh, uh, radical, you know, interrogating some of these radical kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, po policy options. So what are, what are your thoughts on something like that? 
I hate it. And I really think I hate it because you have to define the word political. I run an organization that is a C3 organization dedicated to getting people to try and vote, especially people of color to vote in elections. That is what I care about, expanding the electorate. If you define political or electioneering as telling people to vote, and I'm not allowed to advertise within two days of an election that people should go vote, what times they should vote, how they're able to access their ballot box, if their you know, mail-in ballot could be there on time, you are actually disenfranchising people because the system is complicated. It's different across states. The timing's different across states. And if we're not thoughtful about those implications, then it's actually, I think, more harmful than good. I had a visceral reaction because this was Facebook's thing to do last election cycle. And like, this is the much nicer version of what I had to say about it. Um, and so I just think that while it may seem, you know, ideal that like we don't have to see any more political ads from a candidate perhaps during that time, it may actually have negative consequences for the number of people who vote, even though they do it in Europe. But Europe has a completely different system that seems lovely, mind you, but it's just not ours. <laughs> My LSAT, my LSAT scores weren't so high, but um, I think we'd have some legal issues. Um, yeah, and, and you're right. I mean, it doesn't really necessarily change anything in the world of transparency. Um, we're just gonna you know, front load spending. And we saw that with Facebook, of course. Um, I don't think it changes much, to be honest. I'm, I'm gonna join into that. I, I don't, I'm not gonna even put it in a, in a very legal way. I think how Tatende said it was, was the best way possible. I'm completely not in favor of anything like that. Speaking as an individual citizen, I, I think you're taking away the individual's right to be able to consider facts, information, to be able to make assessments. I agree with the, what Tatende said about it works on disenfranchising people. It provides a lack of access and information. So I'm, I wouldn't be in favor of that, but I do understand that commercial entities had their own choice in decision-making and deciding whether they chose to, to end those ads. But I think it also kind of dis disadvantages the, the voter by doing something like that. Right, and uh, that's all the time we have. So actually, and, and that's a great uh, place to end just because I, I, can, I can slip in a plug for our, the next report that's gonna be coming out of the Center uh, on, on Science and Technology Policy, which is on the Facebook and, and Google ad bans in the 2020 general and, and uh, Georgia runoffs. Uh, so look out for that. That'll be uh, dropping in the next um, month or so. But uh, I just wanna thank all of the panelists so much for coming. This has been just a fascinating uh, conversation and I, I really appreciate you all uh, taking the time to join us. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Scott.